Assalamu alaikum and good evening. Welcome to another episode of The Classics Show. I am your host, Shabnam Riaz. Well, today we've brought to you a very special program. It's going to be a tribute to Dr. Alama Muhammad Iqbal, of course, the poet, philosopher, barrister, such a talented person. And, you know, um, he was given the titles of the Poet of the East, Shahid Ibn Mashriq, and also uh, the National Poet of Pakistan. There's just so much about his personality. We have discussed him in one of our programs before this one as well. And um, this is all, of course, in connection with Iqbal Day. And to talk about um, Alama Iqbal, we have with us in the studios, it's very nice to have you here again, uh, Mr. Ahmed. Hamad, who is a poet and film lecturer from GCU in Lahore. Thank you for being with us here today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And also, again, we have this, you know, honor of discussing uh, Iqbal, as yeah. we did in one of the previous programs as well. But today we've got a different topic. We're mm. not just talking about the personality and the works. We're talking about a specific work, and that one is the reconstruction of religious thought in Islam. Yeah. by Muhammad Iqbal. Now tell us, uh, Hamad, why is this book relevant, and especially in today's world as well? Uh, well, um, Iqbal, uh, when started writing this book, first of all, we should uh, uh, clarify um, that it was not actually a book written by purpose. Mm. These are uh, the lectures mm. um, uh, which were um, uh, after some 
time compiled in the form of a book. Mm. Uh, Iqbal was invited to Madras and Hyderabad and various cities. And Madras Muslim Association actually invited him to deliver some lectures. It was a tradition of that time that they used to call some scholars to discuss uh, things and to deliver lectures. Mm. For example, um, uh, other great people, Sayyid Suleiman Nadvi was also invited to deliver lectures. And, uh, uh, and another uh, great Muslim scholar who, who, who actually converted to Islam, he mm. also wrote uh, a book, Islamic Culture, and those, that book also is the compilation, that's a collection of lectures. So Iqbal also um, wrote some lectures, he wrote in English and he delivered them to the audience of uh, Madras Muslim Association. Um, when so these were not writing, translations, they were written originally in the English language. Yeah, yeah. in the English language. Mm. And um, at that time, when Iqbal was writing these lectures for the audience, of, uh, the audience was consisting of young Muslim scholars and the aspirants who wanted to study philosophy mm. and the aspirants who wanted to, uh, to comprehend this universe in light of the Quran. Actually, Iqbal's addresses were those young people. Uh, and especially in those times when Iqbal uh, started writing these lectures, it was the time when the scientific revolution and uh, especially the industrial revolution was uh, uh, had already taken place in Europe. Mm -hmm. And Muslims were uh, greatly impressed by the ideologies mm -hmm. um, uh, chiseled in Europe and uh, they were uh, uh, almost uh, going away from mm. the central idea of Quran mm. and they were um, in a habit of believing whatever the scientific method used to bring uh, out to them. Mm -hmm. So this was the challenge in front of Iqbal and Iqbal wanted them uh, to uh, come closer to the Quranic teachings again. Mm. So this was a challenge and Iqbal responded uh, to this challenge in form of uh, uh, these lectures. Compilation. And this is how these lectures right. were written and uh, later right. these lectures were compiled in the form of a book. Right, okay. And so there are seven chapters mm. and we are going to discuss those chapters, you know, each one uh, separately. Let's start with the preface. Tell us about that and if you have anything you want to read from there to start with the, the preface. Um. and. Uh, well, I would uh, allow you to uh, read out some paragraph, uh, one or two paragraphs from the preface, okay. because uh, I think b uh, before we entered in the studio, we were discussing that the crux will be discussed, the introduced uh, by Shabnam Riaz. Okay. So I'll be more than happy to listen to that uh, uh, piece of text uh, right. from you. Uh, okay. But as far as the introduction of that preface is concerned, let me uh, very humbly say. Uh, that um, uh, Iqbal actually uh, gives a rationale mm. to these uh, lectures as to why he wrote uh, these lectures mm. for the people. What uh, was the need behind it? What was the motivation? You see, exactly. that's exactly, exactly. right. Uh, he says that Iqbal is, uh, uh, that Quran, that the Quran does not only emphasize over uh, the thought, it emphasizes on the deeds as well. So if your idea is good, mm. your action should also be good. Mm. If your actions are not good, if you mm. are not, not a good human being, mm. your ideas actually don't matter. Mm. This is what exactly Iqbal's uh, central point of mm. writing these, uh, th this book. Mm. He says that the Quran is the book of... Uh, a uh, code of conduct. It's a code of conduct, yes. Mm. And it, it not only invites you to think, mm. but invites you to act as well. So this is where uh, he opens up uh, the lectures from. Right. Um, uh, uh, having said that all, I would request you to please read out that crux. So here from the preface, uh, this is a small excerpt here. In these lectures, which were undertaken at the request of the Madras Muslim Association and delivered at Madras, Hyderabad and Aligarh, I have tried to meet, even though partially, this urgent demand by attempting to reconstruct Muslim religious philosophy with due regard to the philosophical traditions of Islam and the more recent developments in the various domains of human knowledge. And the present moment is quite favorable for such an undertaking. Classical physics has learned to criticize its own foundations. As a result of this criticism, the kind of materialism 
which it originally necessitated, is rapidly disappearing, and the day is not far off when religion and science may discover hitherto unsuspected mutual harmonies. Yeah. Now that is something that's really profound. Yeah. The sort of, you know, the tussle between science and religion. Yeah, exactly. This is exactly what he's talking about. Exactly. You know, um, when he was writing these lectures, um, there was a book written by Professor Eddington, and Eddington was actually trying to comprehend the nature of uh, the structure of the universe. Mm. He came to the conclusion that uh, the um, foundation uh, that the nature of this universe is not material mm. instead of that it is spiritual mm. for example he uh, said that Heisenberg uh, told that it was uh, uh, not possible for a person to determine the, uh, the the position of a subatomic particle and as well as its momentum it was not possible therefore he termed it as the uncertainty principle it is you you can never be certain about the position and about the momentum of a subatomic particle simultaneously and what is subatomic particle obviously this, this is the tiny most unit mm. of this universe mm. if you cannot be certain about something which is material it means means that the, that, that the nature of the universe is not material mm. in the strict sense. Mm. It is uh, loosely material and mm. uh, loosely spiritual, mm. I must say. So it was Eddington who actually uh, broke the ice of the inertia uh, of the modern physics. And mm. this is how the modern physics uh, started off at the advent of the 20, 20th century. And from here, Einstein also had some discoveries and he he wrote his uh, dissertation about the relativity, about the nature of light mm. and about the nature of uh, matter. Mm. And uh, the very famous uh, equation E is equal to MC, MC square, square mm. was very much founded upon Professor uh, Eddington's uh, discoveries. Mm. So th uh, this is where Iqbal starts from. And he says, if is, this has to be believed, mm. that it, the nature of the uh, universe is not material, mm. essentially, mm. then uh, obviously it's a, it's a, it's a ground mm. uh, for me to come forward and for the religious person to come forward and interpret this universe in light of the Quran or the Holy Scripture. Exactly. This is why he wrote this. And uh, he opened up a huge arena there yeah. for um, discussion yeah. and for, you know, examination of exactly what it is, where that divide is, and you know how they they are actually overlapping over each other. Exactly. Because exactly. Um, again, we see so many times that we, when we talk about science and we talk about nature and we talk about all these things, that there is a rhythm. There is a rhythm between what is factual mm -hmm. and the mysticism behind it. True. Uh, I always give an example of the pen. If I'm holding the pen, this is uh, composed of some atoms. And uh, in the previous century, it was said that uh, there is a point where you cannot uh, divide the atom anymore. Hmm. It means that you had some material uh, subatomic particle in your hand. Hmm. But now, um, about when Iqbal was writing these lectures, uh, by that time, the scientists had uh, come to the conclusion that uh, the uh, the ultimate reality of this pen mm. is only uh, spiritual this cannot be determined this is this is smoke only Imagine. and uh, you can only think of this pen in mm. terms of smoke right you know, that is this, really fascinating it is fascinating right we'll continue this discussion we'll be back after a break stay with us Welcome back to the program. Well, we're having a fantastic discussion right now on the reconstruction of religious thought in Islam by Alama Iqbal. We were discussing the preface, and um, after that, now, you know, the first uh, chapter is called Knowledge and Religious Experience. Tell us how this uh, chapter starts and what it deals with. Uh, well, Iqbal um, uh, introduces uh, the structure of uh, universe in this uh, uh, in this lecture and then he goes on to 
um, uh, he, he goes on um, uh, introducing the uh, essence of uh, the Quran. Mm. Uh, first of all, he says that this, the universe we live in is very interesting and everybody is bound to think about it. And there is a triangle of uh, man, God and the universe and obviously relationship between these all three. Mm. Everybody um, uh, tends to think about it to some level, to the capacity of the self, to, to the capacity of an individual. Everybody is uh, destined to think over uh, this triangle. Mm. Uh, and he says that um, uh, he also started thinking over this universe and he came to the conclusion that yeah. uh, this universe is uh, neither material nor spiritual, but it is the combination of these two. Mm. Uh, he does not refute all um, 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 altogether the material nature of the world. And uh, mm. similarly, um, unlike the Western uh, thinkers, he does not refute the spiritual nature of the world, mm. uh, number one. Number two, then he says that it has been the tradition of uh, scholars of Islam mm. that they used to study the Quran in light of the Greek Greek philosophy. Mm. He says that the Greek philosophy is uh, immovable. Mm. The immobility immo of the Greek philosophy is something which actually binds the movement. Mm. Uh, you cannot uh, think freely. You have to be bound uh, uh, of the logic and uh, um, through logic uh, you cannot prove everything. Mm. Or at least uh, the logic cannot satisfy the inner self, the depth, the, the profundity mm. of an individual. Some uh, things are beyond logic. Yes, mm. uh, life is something beyond mm. logic as well. Mm. So uh, this is how this is how he says that it is not good to be um, uh, Greek philosophy, philosophy bound. Mm. We should uh, go beyond that, and the Quran should be studied in light of uh, the modern uh, science as well, mm. um, because to him. A modern science, the gist of uh, the modern time is quite against the classical nature of uh, the Greek philosophy. Uh, Iqbal says that the, um, the essence of the Quran is anti-classical. How anti-classical he will uh, reveal in the fifth lecture mm -hmm. and we'll be discussing the fifth lecture. I'll uh, definitely discuss a little about the anti-classicism of uh, the Quran. Mm. But over here he says that there, there are two ways to reach out to reality. The mm. first one is science. Uh, for that matter, the, f uh, the philosophy itself, mm. you know, um, and the second one is uh, the religious experience. Mm. The sense, the sense experience, mm. is not enough to uh, to reach uh, to the nature, to mm. the essence of the reality. Mm. Uh, and uh, obviously, by reality, he means the reality with a capital R, the ultimate reality. Mm. And he says it is essential. It is. Uh, uh, significant, rather it is mandatory for an individual to, mm. to experience something, to experience the universe religiously. Mm. He says, although this is difficult for an individual to communicate the discovery that mm. comes to him uh, while he is experiencing religion, mm. uh, yet it should not be cancelled and refuted right away. Mm. That if I cannot communicate uh, something to you, mm. for example, I taste chocolate and I cannot communicate the taste of the chocolate to you, mm. it doesn't mean that it does not exist. Right. Uh, similarly, Iqbal says that if I experience that God exists, mm. it does, and if, if I cannot communicate this discovery to you, mm. it doesn't mean that this reality does not exist. Mm. So there is a scientific experience right. through which you can reach out to the essence of the reality mm. and there is a religious experience as well. Mm. Um, Iqbal ends this uh, this lecture over here that if this is not, uh, this cannot, the discovery mm. through this uh, experience cannot be communicated mm. to the other individual, it does not mean that this does, this does not exist. Instead of that, he relies upon it heavily and he says that uh, through, uh, through religious experience, you can actually combine all the powers and all the integral parts of the universe, mm. uh, which the universe is composed of, you know, material and spirits, everything. Mm. Mm. And uh, to him, to Iqbal, uh, Tawheed is the uh, central idea of the of Quran and of the thought as well. Mm. Uh, um, uh, uh, Tawheed is the seed mm. uh, and uh, all fruits and all pluralism mm. is actually the uh, uh, the outcome of that seed which is unitary, 
which which is uh, original which is which is the one only mm. um, the essence yeah the essence mm. of the universe right over here he ends the first chapter right okay uh, the next chapter after that is the philosophical test of the revelations of religious experience that that sounds really really interesting it can is. you elaborate on that yeah um, it is very interesting you know again he says that religious experience can never be cannot be tested objectively scientifically mm. you cannot take your religious experience to some laboratory in order to verify it uh, to disprove it um, mm. this is why he has to write this uh, lecture he says that the classically there have been uh, three arguments in the favor of the existence of god mm. and those three arguments are cosmological argument mm. uh, teleological argument and ontological argument he says that through cosmological argument you can uh, say that god exists and that is the um, uh, 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 law of uh, cause and effect mm. and uh, he says that uh, if uh, um, uh, uh, reaching um, the ultimate reality through cause and effect is the only way that I'm sorry this is uh, that there, there are problems associated with it as well mm. he says that if I am the effect of some cause there should be some a cause of that cause as well and mm. there should be some ultimate cause there is no ultimate uh, cause in this system cause and effect system mm. and he says that infinity is there Th that's why uh, we can that's why he refutes this argument mm. he says that there is no cause of God God is the ultimate cause but logically but philosophically we are bound to believe that there must be a cause of God as well mm. therefore this argument must be refuted on its own grounds mm. you know um, if there is a chain of cause and effect mm. there isn't any system that actually fixes you to stop the chain right this chain has to go on and go it's beyond limitless. God as, yes yeah. mm. it is infinite mm. uh, and uh, there, there, there should be some uh, God is God, God must be the effect of some cause as well mm. logically this mm. is uh, essential this is uh, um, uh, uh, this is th 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 this is actually the order of the logic mm. but this is actual actually this is this does not happen mm. this is not the reality God mm. is the ultimate reality actually so this is how he refutes this argument and then comes um, the teleological one mm. he says that teleological teleological argument tells that uh, there is some power who runs the system of this universe mm. uh, who is the contriver mm. of this all game of universe but this does not tell who actually created this universe so tele teleologically we are introduced to, to a contriver to a driver but mm. not to the creator mm. so that's a problem associated with this argument right. the third one is ontological argument and that is about uh, that tells mm. according to ontological argument mm. idea must be enough to say that something exists mm. if we have some idea of god mm. some um, you know um, some flawless being mm. we do have an idea of some flawless being it means that that must exist he says how ridiculous how ridiculous this is mm. if i have an idea that i have 300 rupees in my pocket it doesn't mean that 300 pocket 300 rupees are really in my pocket mm. so idea is not enough so right. here he refutes these all arguments and then then he says that actually uh, reality is divided into three levels uh, first level is matter second level is life and third level is uh, uh, intellect uh, mind mm. uh, he says that first level is matter uh, matter can be apprehended through science only through physics uh, whereas um, uh, life uh, is some something biological it's a biological phenomenon mm. and we come across uh, uh, this level as well we see that that there is life which is giving uh, we we know the idea of biogenesis and abiogenesis mm. that a life cannot be created by by the one who is dead mm. it means that there is life uh, mm. that is the, there is some ultimate life mm. which is actually giving rise to new lives mm. iqbal says that um, uh, and even uh, in the domain of matter he says that uh, ashara 
mm. Asharites uh, used to believe in atomism, mm. that atoms are constantly being created and being destroyed. Mm. Uh, it means that there is someone who is constantly creating, who is causing this universe to expand constantly mm. at a high speed and, and, and constantly. And at the same time keeping it in control as well. Exactly. Yeah. Amazingly in control. Mm. Awfully, awfully in control. You know, yeah. uh, it is awe inspiring. Absolutely. The, the, the design of the universe is mm. awe inspiring. Mm. You, know, you start fearing of something, such uh, 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 precision mm. and such accuracy mm. was not possible by mm. an ordinary mind. And then True. he says the um, uh, mind is, the, uh, is another level through which we can understand, we can reach to the reality. Mm. Uh, he says that actually this mind is created uh, by the ultimate mind mm. and uh, that mind is living at that that mind is the programmer. Mm. He is uh, writing something. Yohi wa yo meet. He is giving life and he is infusing death as well. Mm. So through, through, through mind only you can reach out to the reality and mind to him uh, is the uh, unity of all mental aspects and all mental aspects if unite are known as khudi uh, ego mm. and to him mind is the ego and through ego only you can reach out to the reality right uh, you know that it's it's just fascinating how he is able to question re-question examine and then come to a conclusion exactly. and be able to put forth that idea to the reader yeah. and to the person listening to these lectures yeah. and um, the next chapter is you know this is also a very very interesting one the conception of god and the meaning of prayer yeah so that that also is, is something that yeah exactly you know, before profound. that before we discuss this lecture I uh, must share uh, the feeling of experiencing this word personally. You see, uh, if I see water is falling on the ground and it does not go uh, upward, mm. it disturbs me. Mm. And I go on um, um, searching for the reality why, as to why water does not uh, go upward mm. and it always uh, falls on the ground. Mm. If some phenomenon if some phenomenon becomes a problem in your mind, mm. that problem becomes a little philosophical. I must say that philosophy starts from here. Mm. That as a common man, things might not be problematic for me as a commoner. Mm. But if I am a student of philosophy, mm. things become really problematic for me. Mm. Why movement at all is essential? Mm. What is the nature of movement? You know, mm. there was a, a man, you know, Mm. who used to believe that there is no movement at all. He says that at some instant, if you look at the moving arrow, that will be static. Mm. And uh, the next moment, mm. the, the, uh, the next slice of moment will... Of travel. Uh, 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 yeah, you Again just, will be... <laughs> yes, it is. The, the, the arrow will always be static if you... Uh, cut the movement into slices and cut, cut the time and into slices. And you freeze slices. that moment. Exactly. Okay. This is how he actually sliced space and mm. sliced the time as well. Mm. You know, and this is how he said that the movement is only a fallacy. Mm. <laughs> you know, and um, uh, it is something we falsely experience. And in reality, movement does not occur. Mm. Uh, but Iqbal says uh, that uh, Zeno actually was a naughty boy mm. and uh, he <laughs> <laughs> actually intrigued in against our mind uh, who says that uh, there are uh, uh, finite uh, points in between two slices. Mm. There are infinite points. Mm. You can never now, modern science tells mm. that infinity is the order of the structure of the universe. Mm. You cannot be finite, you cannot be definite mm. about one point. Mm. So how come, how, how are you saying that... Um, You're isolating one moment in time. <laughs> yeah, mm. exactly. Mm. So static idea of the universe is simply refuted by Iqbal. Mm. From here, I must uh, jump into the third lecture. Mm. He says that um, uh, there are, uh, again, there are three aspects mm. which are associated with God. Mm. And three aspects are knowledge, mm. uh, creativeness, and... Uh, 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 giving life hmm. uh, to to the things. He says that um, uh, knowledge is uh, um, omnipotence. Hmm. 
the third aspect is omnipotence mm. knowledge omnipotence and creativeness mm. he says god is no, god is knowledgeable mm. and his nature of knowledge is entirely different the way we acquire knowledge uh, we we acquire knowledge through sense perception and mm. through idea and mm. through religious experience and mm. mystic experience as well whereas god has uh, his own uh, type of knowledge and he has the knowledge of the past and of the future and of the present as well he is omnipresent Mm. he knows everything and whatever is happening to mm. him is happening in the in the moment we are actually going through it is we who experience the past and the future and not god mm. to god time is static time is a continuum mm. uh, of uh, it, it's like a river which is, which is flowing and uh, god is watching it flowing constantly mm. you know so um, creativeness uh, is also um the major aspect of god and what is creativeness he is constantly creating something new um yo hi wa yo meet ya hayo ya kayum he gives life mm. and he is there um uh, he is calm mm. he is watching everything and he knows everything mm. and uh, he is omnipotent he can mm. do everything whatever he wants mm. you know uh, um uh, he, he is all mighty by mm. being omnipotent mm. uh, i uh, uh, um, i'll uh, uh, elaborate omni uh, potence of god by saying he is almighty he is he he, he has all the mights mm. to run the world and to give life uh, to something which is which was not um, alive a moment mm. before and uh, he is uh, there to give life to time mm. as well so these are the three aspects of god mm. and he says that um, we combine if, if you combine these all three mm. uh, omnipotence nature aspect of god mm. and uh, creativeness of mm. god and knowledgeability of mm. god we come to the conclusion that these all are um, um, our mind our khudi mm. if that is uh, Uh, cultured enough mm. that is trained enough mm. that will be able to comprehend these all three mm. aspects and god will discover uh, himself to such an ego mm. which is capable enough which is actually trained enough mm. to comprehend the knowledgeability mm. the omnipotence and the creativeness of god absolutely true okay the uh, fourth chapter the human ego his freedom and immortality yeah before uh, going to that 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 chapter um, let me finish the last one only small um, segment was left um, and that is he says that um, uh, ego human ego um, is uh, something uh, very interesting human beings are very interesting you know mm. problem of evil again about problems problem of evil is uh, one of the biggest problems of philosophy mm. we say that if god has created everything it means that sins have also been created by god and crimes have, have also also been created by god how to address uh, to these questions this, that's a problem actually that's a big post question in front of a philosopher ikbal says that being omnipotent and being almighty it means and being knowledgeable mm. and being creative god actually overpowers uh, these all pro- problems of evil it's mm. the man who has to suffer from evils mm. and uh, lesser uh, you are um, um, uh, 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 you are bound lesser mm. you are haunted by the evils mm. um, stronger you are having mm. the ego it's like you're given a chessboard you're yeah. given the pieces yeah exactly and it's up to you to align each thing exactly. as you can each piece and strategically realign yeah. and where you are enforcing your weaknesses and your actually you know your your, your um you know strength as well yeah. is something that is self created exactly. so you can't blame it exactly. somewhere else you have to take responsibility for your actions as yeah. well ikbal was greatly inspired by uh, ghazali and mm. ghazali uh, told about three stages of our training of our nafs uh, so uh, the first of all is nafs amara mm. 
hmm. which is actually um, uh, which which corresponds to the animal instinct of hum human beings. Hmm. I if I am hungry, I would uh, eat whatever comes across, you know, hmm. and uh, there wouldn't be any ethical question in front of me that hmm. this does not belong to me. Because it's this a survival size. instinct. Yeah, survival hmm. instinct. Nafs e amara actually. Um, um, will guide you through all evils and all goods mm. without having the sense, the realization mm. of uh, ethics. Then comes nafse uh, lavama. Mm. Over here, you uh, you you get conscious about the evil and the good, and you have the choices. You mm. are and you are conscious about the choices as mm. well. Um, and the last stage, stage is the stage of nafse mutmainna. Uh, over here, you uh, deliberately leave the evils behind, mm. and you actually associate yourself with the greater good, which is God, obviously. Mm. And Iqbal says that these stages are, of the, are for the mankind. Mm. God is the ultimate good. Mm. God is the ultimate reality, mm. and we are only the reflections. But we have to our ego, mm. like our uh, brain and mm. like our body, mm. our ego also takes uh, births. Creativity, creativeness of God actually is um, about creating new egos, mm. uh, um, and the, the ultimate ego is God, and we are smaller egos. Mm. Um, the, the idea of smaller egos was taken from monads, mm. um, which was uh, um, uh, uh, Western philosophy, Western thought. Iqbal says that you train your ego to be as pure. As God is, and once you your ego is uh, pure enough, hmm. you will uh, be uh, will will be the companion of Allah. Means wali Allah. Hmm. Nafs, the stage of uh, nafs mutmainna will be acquired, hmm. and this is how he actually um, uh, goes enters into the fourth uh, lecture. Hmm. You know, when we talk about ego, that that's something that is so fascinating, hmm. because it again. It, it for so many people it becomes such a stumbling block yeah, exactly. in many aspects of their life uh, be it personal growth be it um, professional growth Mental relationships growth. Yeah. Exactly, intellectual growth, intellectual growth. Um, it seems to be uh, something that a person is in always trying to overcome or trying to as you said tame yeah so uh, the ego. Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got that. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I got that. Yes, ego is um, um, as Iqbal says. Uh, ego is something which needs to be trained according to uh, the will of uh, the Creator, mm. the one who created the ego. Mm. Uh, obviously, this word is very colorful, and mm. colors attract us. Mm. Um, the uh, evil has also its own color. Of course, goodness is also is. Uh, In has fact, its own... evil has more temptation towards <laughs> yes. it. Yes, <laughs> unfortunately, so that, that's true. Um, uh, if we train our ego according to the will of the God, obviously, we'll uh, definitely become the. Uh, uh, friend of God, mm. and um, uh, and once we know that we are uh, uh, that we are destined and we can be friends of uh, God, mm. then uh, we can pray, mm. and the ego will pray to God, mm. that, oh Lord. Uh, uh, give me strength mm. to be purer. Mm. Give me strength to be stronger. Mm. To be all powerful like mm. you. To be creative like you. To um, to be knowledgeable like you. Mm. So here comes the concept of uh, prayer as well. Right. Uh, that he says that this this universe is so silent, mm. and uh, we uh, we we have to human beings have to find some power. Mm. Uh, um, uh, to whom we can uh, uh, submit mm. ourselves mm. and to whom we can uh, have a request mm. and have a prayer mm. god is fortunately is the ultimate reality or the or the personality in, in not the strict mm. sense uh, god is the one mm. to whom we should actually uh, prayer Mm. Uh, and uh, our prayers mm. should be directed. So, you know, that's really fascinating because um, even if you talk about people who do not follow a, a, a certain religion, people who are um, atheists, they will still, there still be this universal attraction towards the human being 
to indulge in some sort of meditation. Exactly. To connect with their spiritual side. Yeah. To connect, to have, as you said, prayer. It's, it's you know, that, that connection, having someone to answer that prayer. Yeah. That, that fundamental requirement is there, isn't it? It is. It is indeed. Actually, the ones who don't believe in God, to Iqbal, uh, their uh, journey is half done. Mm. Um, uh, because uh, they are uh, actually haunted by the uh, cosmological realities mm. which are, uh, um, uh, which cover, mm. uh, which, which is actually, which are the cover of uh, human being. Mm. And uh, this, the word out there is uh, uh, something which haunts you and mm -hmm. if you are haunted by the uh, interpretation of modern physics and the mm -hmm. science of uh, this uni universe you will be definitely detached with the creator of uh, this universe mm -hmm. um, obviously you will miss somebody mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, with whom you can talk to mm -hmm. and uh, you can share your feelings mm -hmm. i was uh, reading um, lately in a um, in, in a magazine, perhaps in Time magazine, mm. I came across a lady who was actually a parachuter and uh, unfortunately uh, he was, uh, she was uh, um, uh, in a storm and she had to land over a tree instead of landing on the ground uh -huh. and she was so terrified but she is an atheist. Mm. Um, and she said that uh, when uh, people ask you don't uh, believe in God, what did you do when you were, uh, you know, um, in that tree, mm. neither on the skies and heavens, nor on the ground, what, what were, uh, whom, whom you were calling. Mm. She said, I believe in nature and I believe in uh, angels mm. instead of uh, believing in God. Mm. And I was actually praying to the nature and to my, uh, to, to, to mighty souls and the mm. forefathers, you know, mm. and to the powers of nature. Mm. Oh, powers of nature, please help me. Mm. And I want another life, a new life, you know, see. Right. So this is how you are right. That mm. we, we, uh, we are destined to talk to someone, mm. somebody who can listen to our prayers. And uh, exactly. this silence is horrible. And so to Iqbal, Iqbal was a poet as well. Mm. This is why he terms the, this, silent, this, uh, this design of universe as the silence of universe. Mm. Beautifully explained. Okay, um, the fifth chapter, the spirit of Muslim culture. Yeah, uh, Iqbal was, uh, since he was trying to reconstruct the religious thought, mm. that is why he said that uh, the early mystics of uh, uh, Islam were very dynamic in their uh, teach, in, in their learnings mm. and in their discoveries as well and in their experience as well. Mm. He said that uh, although the early scholars of Islam were used to study uh, the Quran in light of uh, Greek um, um, Greek philosophy, um, yet uh, because they were uh, um, nearer to the era of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that's why uh, uh, they were dynamic and their experience was dynamic enough to uh, to to engage to to, to infuse uh, dynamism and movement into uh, the scholars of uh, early Islam and the mystics of early Islam. But unfortunately, with the passage of time, he says that Median um, uh, classicism overlapped and covered the dynamism of Islam. Mm. And uh, we also, Muslims also, um, uh, started thinking on the lines of uh, Median and in the lines of uh, uh, Greek, philo Greek philosophers. Mm. Here, he says that Spangler, uh, who was a Western uh, thinker, um, wrongly said that uh, the spirit of Islam was the spirit of uh, Magians. He said that no, the spirit of Islam was very dynamic. Mm. Why? Uh, I'll respond to that why later. Mm. But before that, I must um, uh, tell what exactly the answer of Iqbal to Spangler. He said Spangler was um, wrong in saying that the nature of Islam was Magian. He said the nature of, of Islam was very dynamic because Quran always insisting upon having experience, sense, sense experience and Quran, Quran invited the brain to ponder, to contemplate whatever you see mm. or whatever you feel, mm. whatever you perceive through your senses, mm. you must be uh, contemplating 
um, at all those uh, phenomena, hmm. at all those perceptions. Hmm. And this is how Quran is anti-classic. You must be bound only to your sense experience hmm. or uh, to only mind. Hmm. But there must be an interaction between these two. Quran says in this very lecture, he actually uh, quotes uh, Quran's uh, very famous um, uh, very f uh, famous among philosophers, hmm. very famous verses. Afala yata fakaruna ilal ibl kafa khulikat wa ilal jibal kafa nusibat wa ilal ard kafa sutihat wa ilal wale samaye kafa rufiat. He says that don't you think, don't you contemplate as to how a camel has been created and how um, uh, the earth has been flattened for you and mm. how the heavens are high um, above your uh, above, above your heads mm. and uh, do you feel do, do you find any problem um, any shortcoming in the design of the universe you mm. won't find that mm. so actually what quran is doing quran is actually inviting you to contemplate Again. how that book uh, could be termed as uh, classical mm -hmm. or as uh, Magian, mm -hmm. which is actually constantly inviting you to contemplate. Mm -hmm. And Iqbal said that Nabi Akrim Sallallahu was uh, Mujassam Quran, embodification in that sense mm -hmm. of Quran. Of uh, uh, before Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there was deductive uh, 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 reasoning, deductive mm -hmm. reasoning, mm -hmm. uh, but. Uh, and experimentation was not the order of the day. Mm. Logical uh, uh, logicians were there, Philosoph philosophers were there, scientists were absent in the ancient world. You see, mm. it is the it is due to the Quranic uh, uh, injunctions mm. and invitations to contemplate mm. that uh, uh, science came into being. The era of positivity, positivism, mm. Mm. Uh, came into being. Why mm. Quran actually invited you to contemplate mm. and not not only contemplate but first of all experience the reality mm. if this is hard this is solid this must be something else okay. this is different from liquid and mm. liquid is, is different from uh, gas mm. uh, you, you you imbibe everything mm. you experience everything mm. and now start and interpreting that the principle of movement in the structure of Islam and then the key question is religion possible yeah. so uh, well, uh, to uh, the scholars, the key lecture is the sixth one and not the seventh one. Mm. And uh, interestingly, the seventh lecture was uh, not the part of uh, reconstruction of religious thought in Islam, mm -hmm. was not the part of this book. Mm -hmm. He delivered only six lectures to the Muslim audience and the seventh lecture was delivered to the non-Muslim audience. Okay. Well, coming back to the sixth lecture. Um, we have actually traveled through sense perception and religious experience and uh, Hudi ego and the ultimate ego. Now comes the final stage mm. in which Iqbal says that uh, uh, why I say uh, to, to, to Iqbal why the nature uh, of uh, Islam is scientific because it is um, uh, always open to accept new things. It means that uh, it is always on the move. Hmm. If you are resting over here, you cannot uh, see what is uh, lying next to me. But if I keep on moving, obviously everything will come to me hmm. or I'll come to them and new things happen. I will be quite, uh, I will be capable enough to hold and to accept the new realities. Progression actually. Hmm. Hmm. So to Iqbal, the window of ijtihad mm. is uh, something which makes this religion entirely different from all the classical Absolutely. religions. Mm. You are open to make your own jurisprudence mm. through ijtihad. If you don't find uh, the um, uh, uh, you know specs of uh, the modern day life in your uh, scripture, mm. uh, you can um, sit together mm. and you can think and you can contem contemplate scientifically. For example, a very naive example, mm. and that is if you want to um, uh, 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 perform Salat, Namaz mm. on the moon, mm. um, where should be um, uh, uh, your your face mm. and uh, where fish where should be your face directing to mm. Mm. you know there is no Kaaba mm. and uh, we have to you know if we are living in the west we our face uh, always uh, is towards the east yeah. and if we are living in the east we we, we actually 
um, our face is face, um, directed to the west because Kaaba is there. If you are performing Salat on the uh, moon mm. in the space mm. and so many new questions, mm. I mean uh, blood trans, uh, organ transplantation, mm. what is the jurisprudence, Islamic jurisprudence on it? Iqbal says that Islam is open, mm. other scriptures or other religions mm. are not as much capable mm. as the, uh, this religion is, mm. uh, sit together, contemplate. And Which again shows how, you know, it's practicality again yeah, exactly. to be implemented, to be lived through and how it's made itself, you know, exactly. so so doable in, in other words. Exactly. Uh, so the, we're coming to the end of the programme, so the last chapter, Is Religion Possible? A few words on that one. A few words. Uh, well, um, uh, uh, let me please uh, comment on the last uh, two scholars, which is the last lecture, is the sixth one. Yeah. Um, um, he wanted to, Iqbal wanted to um, reconstruct the legal thought of Islam as well. Mm. Uh, this is why he is um, the, in favor of uh, the principle of movement in Islam. He says that the ijtihad is uh, the only window which can uh, um, uh, make Islam relevant. Relevant, and, yes, which is the main word. For all the ages absolutely. to come. Absolutely. For the, all the ages to come. Absolutely. Is religion possible? He says that uh, through science, you sense the reality through, um, um, uh, through your five senses only. Whereas uh, through religion, through religious experience again, mm. that, that is uh, a reality actually um, mm, uh, manifests itself onto your mind and not onto your perception. You know, so Gee. this is uh, this is why he says that yes, if something is possible in the modern times, mm. if something is relevant in the modern times, that is uh, religion only because it is only through religion that you not only gather knowledge from your outer world but mm. also you can become become a good human being. Mm. Iqbal says it's not. Uh, um, it's not sufficient for you to gather knowledge. It is, uh, it is necessary for you to become a good human being. Mm. And this is what exactly he referred to in the preface as well. And this is how we complete the whole of this book. Humanity. Humanity, yes. Which of course is, again, is the embodiment of Islam. Exactly. Humanity. Exactly. So that's where you come to this full circle. Um, Ahmed Hamad Sab, thank you so much for joining us here today. And it, this was actually quite a difficult a difficult subject, but you know, you explained it so well and made it so relatable to the people who, you know, hadn't even um, known about this book before. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. So it was a pleasure to have our guest here today to discuss uh, Alama Muhammad Iqbal's uh, book, The Re Reconstruction of Religious Thought in Islam and so many so many things were touched upon and everyone of course will take away their own version of what appealed to them but at the end of the day it's all about coming back to humanity and being humanistic and to understand that the the human mind wants answers and it's going to ask many questions so nurture yourself and all those people around you as well until next week bye bye